Today we're talking about the Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro and what this one does that the original did not. Hey folks, I'm Photo Joseph. Today I'm going to be talking specifically about the new features in the ATEM Mini Pro. I won't be covering everything that is the same between this and the original A10 Mini because I already did a long video on that that has been seen by a bunch of people, quite possibly yourself. And if you haven't seen it, do go check that one out first because in that video, I cover all the basics of what this unit does. This video is specifically about what's new in the A10 Mini Pro. And we're gonna start with multi-view. This is multi-view. Multi-view allows you to see all four of your HDMI inputs as well as your program out your preview if you've chosen to work that way, and we'll get into that, your audio status, your live streaming status, your recording status, and the current still store all in one view. This is something the original one did not have that a lot of people wish that it did, and it is really a big deal. It allows you to have so much more control and overview and just visibility of your entire program and what you're getting ready to push out to air. So if you're running a show by yourself, it's just you, you're the one on air, you're probably not gonna use multi-view. It'd be too much to be looking at that and trying to switch and talk to your audience at the same time. But if you're operating the switcher for somebody else, then this is absolutely invaluable. So even if you're not interested in using the A10 Mini to live stream from the unit itself, if you are controlling a show, then this alone is a fantastic feature to have. So let's take a look at how this works. First of all, to activate it, you go into the A10 settings and under the output menu, you set it to multi-view or on the A10 Mini itself, you just push the MV or multi-view button. Or you can switch this over to view the program out or individual inputs, one, two, three, and four on here. The difference between choosing the camera angle on the video out, which is what that tab is, versus just changing camera angles here, is that this is your actual program out. This is what your audience will see. Whereas this is what you see, only you see this. So if you need to get a close up view of one of the camera inputs, you can easily switch over to that. What's going on in camera two? You can push that button, take a look at it, go, oh, okay, everything's good. And then go back to the multi view and get the overall view. So it's really powerful to have those options right there at your fingertips. Now there's more that you can set up and control inside of multi view, but for that, we need to go over to the software again. Back in the ATEM control software, if you click on the gear icon in the bottom left corner, that'll open the settings and then switch to multi view. And here you'll see the different controls that you have. First of all, I can switch between the preview and the program and just swap their order on the screen if I wanted to do that. I can choose to have title safe areas showing up. And so this is showing title safe for 16 by nine as well as a four by three area. So if for some reason you're broadcasting to four three or you need to be safe for four three, you've got that covered. I'm gonna leave that off. Then you have audio level meters that can show up on any or all of the inputs. And there's even a button to turn them all on for you. And when I turn them all on, you can see now that I have audio level meters showing up on all of my inputs, including the program out. But if I'm not using one of the audio tracks, so for example, I'm not using the audio from over the shoulder, I don't care about the audio from the ATEM close-up, I can disable those and then I just don't see them on the screen and it keeps things a little bit cleaner. I do like to keep it enabled on the program out because this shows me what the audience is hearing. If I see these meters bouncing, then I know the audience can hear me. And on that note, another question that came up a lot with the earlier ATEM was how do you monitor audio? There's no headphone jack on the ATEM Mini or on the ATEM Mini Pro. So how are you supposed to monitor what the audience is hearing? Well, you do have your HDMI out, and even as it's configured right now in this multi-view mode, I can hear through the headphone port on this monitor whatever the audience is hearing. So you do have that capability. You just need to plug in your headphones into the monitor. All right, back to the settings over here. That's everything in the multi-view tab, but you may have noticed that these are all named something special. This one's called main camera and over the shoulder, ATEM close-up, iPad. I can change these labels so that they make sense when I'm looking at them on screen. To do that, you go to the labels menu. Specifically, we're looking at input and we have four inputs here, input one, two, three, and four. And in here, I can type in whatever I want. And there's two different labels. There's the long name and the short name or the name and the label. So for example, this one I called main camera and then the short version, which can only be four letters, I called main over the shoulder, SHLD, shoulder, ATEM CU, close up, ATEM, and then iPad, iPad. The long names show up on the multi-view itself. So there's main camera, over the shoulder, ATEM CU, iPad, you also see the program, and the preview up here, media player one, and down here it'll tell me where I'm streaming to, YouTube in this case, we'll come to that. The short names show up on the buttons. So if I click save now and go to the switcher, 
you'll see the short names showing up on these buttons here, main, shold, ATEM, and iPad. And if you're wondering why there's so many blank buttons on here, that's because the same software, the same interface is used on the much bigger ATEMs, which have a lot more inputs. This one's limited to four inputs, and so those are the buttons that we see. If I do want to switch the hardware into the preview mode, I have to go into the ATEM setup. There's the ATEM Mini Pro. Select that and choose the switching mode from Cut Bus to Program Preview. Now, this is a feature that existed in the original A10 Mini. However, without the multi-view, it became a lot harder to use. But now that we have multi-view, I can more effectively show you how it works. So let's go ahead and save this. And then I'll switch over to the ATEM. And now when I hit one of the input buttons, it goes green instead of going red. And that has not changed the active angle. This is the program out, and this is now the preview. So as I click on a different button on here, that loads into the preview window, but the program, what's going out to the audience, doesn't change. That doesn't change until I hit either the cut or the auto button. So right now it's set to cut, so I'll just hit cut, and that switches over to that other input. Let's switch over to camera two, and this time I'll do auto, and it's gonna do a cross dissolve. This format allows you more control over what's going to air. Not only can you choose the camera angle, but you could build in a lower third, you could put in a graphic, you could put in a green screen effect. You can do all kinds of things in the preview, getting it ready to go to air, and then you hit the button to take that to air. Or again, if you're switching by yourself, then it's a lot easier to just hit the button once and have it switch. Finally, you'll see in the lower right corner that we can see all of our audio. This is all the inputs coming in on all the cameras. And if we look over at the audio tab in the software, we'll see the same thing there. If I activate one of the audio channels, we're gonna see that represented up here as well. So for example, let's take the audio from channel four on, and we see that that has now lit up. If I turn that off and turn on three, we'll see three on and so on. So we're always seeing exactly what's happening with our audio down here. In fact, if we turn on any of the Fairlight audio controls, we're gonna get a representation of that in here as well. Let's go over to the software. And for example, on my main mic here, I may open this up and wanna enable some dynamics, an expander, a gate, or anything like that. And now if we look back at the screen here, we can see an indicator that that has been activated. Next, let's talk about live streaming. But before we can talk about how to set up live streaming, we have to talk about how to get the A10 Mini Pro onto your network. Fortunately, it's really easy. There's an ethernet port on the back of the A10 Mini. Just plug that into your local network, so any open space on your switch, and you're basically on. It'll default to DHCP, which means that essentially, once you plug it in, it's gonna find itself and show up in the software. It's really dead easy. Now, there are other ways to connect it. For example, you can take the ethernet from the A10 Mini Pro and plug that into an ethernet port on your computer, and then using the Wi-Fi on the computer or a cellular connection that you're tethering to, also stream. So there's lots of different configurations. But that's the kind of thing that you're going to want to read the manual for. But let's take a look at how it is set up in here. If I go to the ATEM software control and go to the connection menu, you'll see in here that I can choose to search for a manual IP address. So if I have entered one manually, I can search for it here. But look down here. It just automatically finds the switchers on my network. There's the ATEM Mini Pro and my original ATEM Mini. Once that's selected, you just hit connect and it connects, which of course we've already connected to it. Let's take a look at the streaming setup. From the switcher tab, there's a new live stream option under output. And we'll see right now it's set to off because I'm not yet streaming. And I can choose what platform I want to stream to, Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube. Now it is actually possible to stream to any RTMP network. You have to modify the XML file and that's not something I'm going to show in this video. But if it's something you do want to see, let me know in the comments and I'll make another video about that. Built in though, it's really easy to get it onto Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube. I'm going to choose YouTube because that's where I primarily go. And the next option is which server, the primary or the secondary server. If you're not familiar with streaming to YouTube, you can choose to stream at any time to either primary or secondary server. The idea is, and the intention is, that you would stream the same show from two totally independent networks to the primary and another to the secondary. That way, if something happens to the primary, that means your internet connection, your streaming hardware, whatever, something goes wrong, YouTube will automatically fall back to the secondary. So here you choose which one you're going to. You would start with the primary, but if you already have a primary running elsewhere, then of course you'd set this to the secondary. I'll go ahead and set it to primary. And next you need to enter your key. Where's the key come from? Well, this comes from YouTube itself. So let's go over and create a new live show for YouTube. Log into YouTube, and then up here under the create video or post menu, you'll see a go live option. There may be some restrictions on who can go live. I think you have to have a certain number of subscribers before you can. I honestly don't remember, but that's the kind of thing that if you don't see a go live option here, then just Google it, you'll figure it out. I click on go live and that'll take me to the live streaming studio. Because I've live streamed before, it's offering to create a new stream based off of the previous settings. 
I actually have no idea what you'd see if you've never streamed before. I guess that's just a button that says new, but I'm gonna dismiss this and we'll start from scratch. When I click dismiss, it automatically opens up a new stream dialog. So let's go ahead and call this test from the ATEM Mini Pro. And I'm gonna leave this as a private event to make sure that nobody accidentally finds it. The difference being public, of course, is fully public and it's gonna be on your YouTube page. Unlisted means it's available for anybody who has the address and private means that only you can see it. So I'm gonna leave it for private for now. Fill in your description, choose a category if you like. You can choose to schedule this for later for a private event that doesn't actually matter, but if you're doing a public show, then of course you can schedule when that's gonna actually go live. You can enable monetization if that's available to you, add a custom thumbnail, and you do need to choose whether your show is made for kids or not. That's all there is to it. Click Create Stream, and that'll take you to the streaming studio where at the moment you'll see connect streaming software to start preview, a little spinning thing here telling you that it's waiting for data. And by the way, if you set this up weeks in advance before your live show, that's fine. At this point, you can just close this out and you're done. But when it's time to stream, come back here and get the key. You'll see under the stream key data, you've got your streaming URL, which you actually don't need to enter because that's hard coded into the ATEM. But the stream key here is what you need. You can click the I to reveal the key if you want to, but you don't actually have to. You can just click the copy button and copy that to the clipboard. It is actually really important that that key does not get out. You can't let anybody know what that key is. Now, you just saw my key for this show, but that's okay because this show will be deleted by the time you watch this. If someone else gets your key, they could hijack your live show. So it's super important that you don't show it. That's copied to the clipboard. Now I'll head back over to the ATEM software and simply drop that key into place. The next choice is my streaming quality. I can choose streaming low, medium, or high. And when you select one of the qualities, you'll see the bitrate listed here, in this case, six megabits per second. This tells you a couple of things. First of all, you need to make sure that you have enough bandwidth for that bitrate. In this case, if I'm gonna stream high, it's gonna take six megabit. And you might see something different there. It's gonna depend on what your frame rate and size is. I'm currently set to 1080p at 2997. So that is calculated at six megabits per second. Now I need to have at least 10 megabit, preferably 12 upload speed to be able to stream at that quality. So run speed test. And if you don't have that much bandwidth, then you're gonna to have to knock it back a bit. Don't be tempted if you look at your bandwidth and you see, oh, I've got six megabit, I can stream at six. Don't do it, it's not gonna work out. You need overhead at minimum 50% more, but it's better to have twice as much as you need for the actual stream. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it at six megabit because I know I've got the bandwidth. And then I'll click this box here, display status, that shows me the status of what's going on down here. At this point, I can start streaming by clicking on air here, or I can do it on the hardware itself. So let's go ahead and push the button. On air. We'll see it shows on air up here. It gives me the current data rate. It shows me the cache info and how long I've been live. The cache info is really important. The ATEM will actually buffer frames so that if there's any kind of hiccup in the internet connection, it doesn't just drop frames and not show the audience what you were supposed to show them. It will actually hold off and then deliver that. Now, if you get a really bad connection or your internet starts to stutter, that may drop in quality. You'll see this change from okay to, well, something else. But as long as that says okay, then you know you're good to go. If you see it stuttering a lot, if you see it constantly dropping below okay, then that might be an indicator that you're trying to stream too high of a bandwidth. All right, let's take a look and see what this show actually looks like that is now on the air. Remember, it's still a private show. I'll go back over to Chrome and we can see right there, there it is. And I have a button here that says go live. Now this is really important. The fact that over here, it says that it's on air doesn't actually tell me that I am actually streaming live to the public. It is a two-step process. The ATEM Mini Pro starts streaming to YouTube and then on YouTube, you go to that interface, you make sure that everything's looking good and okay, and as long as you're happy, then you click the go live button and that's what takes the show live to the air. So let's go ahead and click it. And to preview this, I'm gonna click the share button, grab that URL there, I'll just copy that, open a new tab and paste that in. And it'll take a couple of moments before everything catches up and it starts. And there we go. So you can see there that we are currently actively on the air. That's great. So that's all it takes. It's really straightforward. Just go in there to choose your platform and it's basically the same thing for Twitch or Facebook. Set up your stream, grab the key, drop it in and hit go. And that's all there is to it. Couldn't be any easier, frankly. All right, now let's talk about recording. That's another big feature in the A10 Mini Pro. You have the ability to record your program out onto a little SSD drive. 
In fact, you can save it to any USB drive, but a little SSD like this just makes it really easy. Let me turn off this stream first. I'll go back to my live streaming dashboard and click on end stream. At that point, the stream has ended. Now, don't forget to stop streaming from the ATEM itself as well. We can do that in hardware. We'll just click the off button and we are now off the air. If you click the off button here without stopping the show, that's fine. YouTube will probably wait a moment to see if you come back and then it'll end the show. Sometimes it just ends the show as soon as the stream stops. It's, it's a little bit finicky and unpredictable that way. Just try not to end the show prematurely. Make sure that you stop on both ends to be safe. All right, back to recording. So the idea behind recording your program here is that you're creating a local file, a local copy of the same show that was streamed online. This isn't something you absolutely have to do. If you're streaming to YouTube, you are going to have a copy of that stream on YouTube. You could re-download it from there. But of course, you risk that the file that you have in YouTube could have some corruption, could have some hiccups to it. If there's anything that happened during your stream, then what YouTube got is, of course, what it recorded. But here, by recording locally, you're getting the pristine quality of the stream that you pushed out. Now, what you get on here is the same quality of what you set in the live streaming settings. If you streamed low quality, that's what you're going to get here. This is literally saving the exact same file that was pushed up to the internet. That's important to know. Now, if we look in the recording settings, we'll see under here that we have some record stream options. And the first thing we'll see is a file name. So you can call it whatever you like. I've got it called Photo Joseph. And we see the drive that is currently plugged in. Drive one is listed as that drive there. It also shows me how much space is on the drive, or basically meaning how long I can record for. If you're going to stream a really long show, you can actually save your show over multiple hard drives. All you have to do is plug them in via a hub, and you'll be able to transition from one drive to the next. In fact, it even works if you piggyback one drive on top of another. So for example, I have this old USB drive here. I'm going to go ahead and take this guy and just plug this into the back of the ATEM Mini. And then I'm going to take my SSD and plug... Then I'm going to take my SSD and plug this into this drive. Because it's a spinning platter drive, it's going to take a moment to spin up. But as soon as it does, we're going to see it show up here, and we're going to see both of the drives. There's drive one is the SSD. It's drive one because it has the most space, so the software has automatically prioritized that. And drive two is this USB drive called Video Archive 2. I could change the order if I wanted to. I could say, no, no, go to Video Archive 2 first, and then go to this one. I'll go ahead and click on display status, which shows the status down here. And this next option, record in all cameras, isn't something that I can actually show you. This requires Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, which I don't have any of. But what this will do is automatically trigger recording in the camera. So in the memory in the camera itself, it'll record the show. And what that means is it's recording that camera angle. It's called an ISO for isolated stream. So let's say you have four Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras plugged into your A10 Mini Pro. When you're doing your live show, not only do you have the program out, the edited version of your show, you can also have a complete copy of every single camera individually that you can then re-edit as a multicam edit later. It's a pretty powerful feature. Unfortunately, it only works with the Blackmagic cameras, but if you don't have Blackmagic cameras like I don't, you can still walk around and push record on every one of your cameras. So you're not completely out of the feature, but if you do have those cameras, then this makes it easy. Back in the software, you'll see that we have stop and record buttons, and there's a switch option as well. But once again, we can do all of this from the ATEM hardware. I'll go ahead and hit record on here, and that is now recording the live show. We see the status up here on the multi-view, and at this point, as I start switching the show, cutting between them, we are now recording that show. If I want to switch drives instead of waiting for one to fill up, I just want to switch now for whatever reason, I can do that in the software with the switch button, or I can do it on the hardware by pressing and holding on the record button for a couple seconds, and it will automatically switch over to the other drive. Now that it's recording on drive two, I want to stop recording and show you the file, but I'm going to do something that's a little bit crazy. I'm going to yank the drive out of this other USB drive. Just unplug it. In fact, let's just do it from here. I'll just, just unplug the whole thing, just like that. You should never do that. Why would you do something like that? The way that these files are written, they're actually closed. The file gets closed every couple of seconds or so, so that if you do what I just did, yank it out, you don't lose the file. You still have that data. Let's take a look. I'll go ahead and take this little drive, because that's the one that I just switched to, and we'll look at the last couple of seconds before I yank the plug. 
There's the show, Photo Joseph. I remember I was only recording for a few moments, but we see it. There's the program. Looks like I had my iPad on the screen. And then it ends nice and cleanly. It's an incredible feature, frankly. It's always possible that someone accidentally rips out a drive, and usually that spells disaster. But in this case, you're totally saved. I think that's awesome. There's a couple other things I want to show you. Let's go to the audio tab. And you may have noticed that this entire time I've had my audio going into mic input one. My microphone, the wireless lab that I'm wearing right now, is feeding into a Zoom F6 recorder, which is recording the show for the purposes of this edit, the show that you're watching right now. But then from the Zoom F6, I have a line out going into the back of the A10 Mini Pro. Now, those of you who have watched the other show or have used the A10 Mini know that one of the limitations that is unfortunately not addressed in this version of the software or hardware is there's no way to delay the audio coming into the microphone input. The audio coming into the A10 Mini Pro is going to be out of sync with the video coming in if you don't delay it. The reason for that is all video that comes out of a camera over HDMI is delayed. This is an inherent process of HDMI. Any camera that has HDMI has a delay. Some cameras have a little bit more than others, but there's always a delay. So the easiest way to keep your audio in sync, and this is something we've talked about before, is to route your audio through the camera. That way your audio and video are perfectly in sync and it makes it easy. But if you want to route your audio through a mixing board or a recorder like I am here, and then feed it into the mic input, you can absolutely do that, but you have to program in the delay externally. You can't do it in software. Now, this is something I still have high hopes that Blackmagic will implement. For all the features they've packed into this thing, I think it's something they could do. I don't know if technically it's not possible, and that's why they haven't. But fingers crossed, we'll cross them all, that they get this in there. In the meantime, if you're going to do it this way, you have to do it in the hardware. And the Zoom F6, fortunately, has a audio delay feature in it. So I had to go in and go back and forth and find the right amount. And it turns out that delaying it by six frames on a 30 frame per second timeline works out perfectly. So now the audio and the video are perfectly in sync. But this is an important thing that you do need to know if you're going to run your audio that way. Another thing that I want to talk about is this right here, USB. For those of you that are familiar with the A10 Mini, you know that the easiest way to connect your A10 Mini to your computer was simply over USB. You didn't have to worry about Ethernet, you didn't have to worry about the network, it was just a direct connection and off you went. You can still do that. I can still plug the A10 Mini Pro into my computer over USB and access the A10 Mini Pro as a webcam in software like Skype or FaceTime or Zoom meetings or GoToWebinar or whatever you like. However, if I have the A10 Mini Pro plugged in over USB, I no longer had the ability to record the program out. I can't record on the USB port while simultaneously feeding the video into the computer over USB. It's one or the other. So if you're going to use this as a webcam, then you do need to plug it in over USB. There's no way for the software, for Skype or anything else, to see the A10 Mini over the network. It has to come in over USB. Or you could take an HDMI program out and route that through through a encoder, but that's getting a bit complicated. If you want to use this as a webcam, USB-C is the way to go. If you then want to live stream your show, you don't actually have to change anything. You can just go ahead and live stream without changing any connections, but you do give up the ability to record onto a little drive like this. So if this is something you want to do, you're going to have to switch ports. It's not a big deal. It's just one cable to plug and unplug. But if you are going to use the ATEM Mini Pro both as a webcam switcher and as a live streaming device, that is something you're going to have to swap out. So that's about it. This device is remarkable. It has packed a huge amount of features into it. I, I'm super impressed with what this is. I love the original A10 Mini. I was crazy excited about that. The thing that it was missing was the ability to live stream. And you can still live stream with software. Let's not forget that. You can use software like OBS or Wirecast and stream. However, you have a better quality stream when you go through hardware. You're not taxing your system. And it is just a much better way to go. Streaming with hardware is always my choice, and now the A10 Mini Pro makes this super easy. If you want to know more about this hardware, let me know in the comments below. I'm sure there's a lot of questions you'll have. Go ahead and drop them in there, and if I get the same question enough times, I'll put it into another show. Otherwise, I'll do my best to answer those comments in there. Thanks a bunch for watching today, and of course, if you do decide to buy one, I would love it if you use my affiliate links down below. It helps keep the show running. Take care, you guys, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, good. You're still here. I realized as I shut everything down that I completely forgot one part of this. I wanted to tell you about this whole crazy setup here and what's going on to feed all these inputs into the A10 Mini Pro because I know people are going to be interested. So let me just give you a little tour. This is a GH5 on a Noctocron lens and it is feeding into a Ninja 5 recorder and then out of the recorder is looping into a Hollyland 
wireless transmitter, HDMI wireless transmitter. The receiver for that is right here. This is the new 400 model. That receiver is then plugged into the A10 Mini Pro. So this way I've got my camera pretty far away from me, don't have to run a cable across the room, and I'm recording the show on there to ProRes on the Ninja 5. Next camera is this one here. That is an S1H plugged into a Ninja 5 as well, recording once again in ProRes in 4K. Out of the Ninja 5 is plugged into another wireless transmitter. So that is another Hollyland that I've got here. That's the 300 model, and that is transmitting to there. Obviously, at this proximity, I could have just run a cable, but it's one of those, you got it, let's use it. Camera 3 is up here. This is a GH5S with a 25mm f1.4 lens, obviously pointing straight down and giving me a top-down view of the mixer here. This is a kind of a fun way to set this up, and I'll actually flip that image over in post so it doesn't look upside down to you in camera. This is also feeding into a Shogun that's over here on the side recording into ProRes as well. And then finally, I have the actual multi-view that I'm recording. So out of the A10 Mini Pro is HDMI into this monitor for multi-view, but between the Mini and the monitor is another Ninja. You can see it right here. That is recording, once again, this entire thing at its full resolution, which is only 1080p, so it's not the same resolution as everything else, but this gives me a nice clean version of this for you guys to see. I could have plugged anything into here, a laptop or whatever, uh, but I chose to put those three cameras in, and then the fourth input is my iPad that's sitting there with the USB-C to HDMI adapter and then HDMI plugged into here. And that's giving me just, well, whatever's on the iPad. It's just a way for me to have something else playing on there, and of course it could be absolutely anything. So that's the setup. I told you about the Zoom microphone, and I think that's about it. All right, get out of here. See you next time.